Buenos días. Buenos días, señor Jerry. Hey, todo bien, todo bien. <laughs> so, hoy vamos a discutir, vamos a, vamos a eh, describir cosas de artificial inteligencia, eh, proyectos que, que vamos a ganar y también pensamos que ellos van a estar muy bien en unas una dos años. Ahora no, la gente no, no están buscando directamente, pero creo que va, va a estar muy bien. And for those of you following at home, those 7,500 different words in Spanish equal AI is coming, AI is good, get some. Get you some. So we're going to talk AI. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're not going to dwell a lot on the market prices and this and that. We're going to do a quick run through. Anything notable we will mention, but that's really about it. We will look at Pro Coin Telegraph and see if anything's cool or interesting there. And then we are off to talk about Singularity Net, Fetch, and just the greater idea of what we think these um, autonomous economic agents might do. I am going to read an opinion piece. I had a lot of questions about the Biden, the tax, the bid, the bid. And I read a really good article that's kind of game theoretical. And we love our game theory. So I'll probably start with that. We'll, we'll read our little our thought piece. And then we will get to the guts of it. But first, uh, Jerry, what's going on in your world? Well, I'm, I'll tell you, you brought up the Biden tax plan. I think the biggest signal I'm getting from that doesn't have really anything to do with selling crypto. It has everything to do with getting out of traditional retirement plans. So for all you folks at home that have been putting tax deferred dollars in 401k plans or self, if you're self-employed and created some, some offshoot derivative of a 401k, like a, um, uh, a spec Z or the, one of those other type brother, sister type programs. When you're doing the tax deferred in, remember when you retire, you got to pay the tax man. And here's the thing that I think is interesting. Taxes generally, and you guys discussed this on your show yesterday, are very rarely ever temporary, even though they may be brought to the public as being a temporary measure, they're generally permanent. And so when you're looking at taxation in your retirement years, the time that you can least afford taxation because you have no income to speak of other than your retirement, that's the worst time in the world to be paying taxes on money that you made 15, 10, five, three years ago. So with that being said, it's time to evaluate these products that Wall Street has thrust upon us over the last 30 years as our quote unquote safety net for when we retire. Between what the fund managers take on a yearly basis and what the tax man will end up taking when it's time for those disbursements to start rolling out, it's time to really reconsider where you are and what you're doing. And, and that's kind of where my head's been at for a while and discussing it with my Patreon group. And uh, I'm telling you, it, it appears the solution is get out and get into something better. And we can, of course, that's a big part of our, uh, <laughs> with the Costa Rican cast. <laughs> I think there's, is there an inside joke there between you and Adam on that one? No, I haven't I heard the, your new name. I think you, you have become the Costa Rican Casanova. Okay. We're going to get started. Let me first say hello to everyone. For those of you that didn't catch the show yesterday, we had a lot of fun. Um, we job. had Neil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder on. The cool thing is we're going to start doing that on a regular basis. Um, I am also talking to the people at MMP. Uh, about a potential deal there, a broadcast deal, and still talking to the people at Raging Bull who got out of jail. Turns out they had to refund some money, and that was it. All the allegations were dropped, and that was the end of it. So there was a couple hundred people that wanted to, I guess, cancel their memberships, and it was – anyway, it's done. So they're out of jail. They are going to start broadcasting again, and we are going to do what makes the most sense – for our community and their community, the best amalgam of communities. Um, so 
The show must go on. All right, let me say hello to SJO Theta TV, Scorpion, Video Tuber, Gordon Bennett, Andy Panda, Claire Smith, Belinda Cook, Baykeeper, Stress Relief, Hulagram, Sniper Princess, don't get her angry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see. We have CC Brown, Solid Gold, JR80, Ocean Dawn, Get Involved, uh, WBS 2014. Over on the WhoTubes, we have, and for some of you that are on Facebook Live, for some reason Facebook Live was having some issues. They sent out little warnings, whatever. Stanley Pitts, Pete Kelly, Darting Uphill, um, Wolverine Maniac, two very aggressive things thrown together, uh, Bitcoin Candy, uh, Wood HK, Jimmy James, Scorpion on the other side, Scott Hill, Joe Fernandez, Kionda, Biotech Breakout, of course, Brady in the house, Pablo, Antonio holding it down, JJ, Emmanuel, what up, Emmanuel, uh, Michael, Ella Paul, Ashley and David, Sylvia, Voitech, Barno, Patsy Green, Les, Judy Phil, Leon, what's up, Leon? Uh, Adam, uh, who runs Texas Stakes, our official stake pool for crypto and coffee. The best staking pool if you like money. If you don't like money, well, go, go somewhere else. All right. Expat Matt and Plu. Cool. I think we pretty much got it. S2K, Hobo, uh, Juarez, Augustine, Kionda. All right. Cool. Um, and then there was one question. Let's see. Please, sooner. Okay. So um, the show gets uploaded um, to YouTube as fast as the, as fast as we do it, it should be available right then instantly. So if you're catching it from YouTube, if you're having trouble catching the repeat on Theta, it's because Theta is very weird. Theta doesn't index these videos. We have to down. This is so stupid. We have to download it from YouTube and re-upload it to Theta, even though it goes out live to Theta. My guess is they'll work on that because this stuff should be automatically indexed. It's not right now. And I'm actually on my other computer. You can't see it, but it's sitting there slowly uploading yesterday's episode. I just got yesterday's episode and the episode before. So if you're on Theta, there's just a weirdness. But anywhere else, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, EE, what's going on? All right. We're going to go to our non-commercial break where no one pays us for nothing. And then we'll be, <laughs> and we'll be right back to continue our non-paid nothingness. Uh, welcome to our abyss, Jerry and Nick's Crypto Abyss. Maybe that's a cool name for a show. It is. Okay, cool. Bam. Let's go through it really quickly. I want to just touch upon a couple of details. Don't you turn off on me. Don't you turn off on me. I have to keep watching this other computer because if you stop uploading a video on Theta, you have to start over. And I'm like 30 minutes in. And apparently it's like minute for minute. Theta's got some some little areas they need to square away. Okay. Um Let's look over here. What, what do we got that's interesting going on? So we're over on ProCoin Telegraph. We're just taking a quick look. Um, you guys know how I play it. I, I've been pretty obvious about how I play it. I play it 90 or better. I'm willing to take a position, hold it for about a week. And if I can get 25% or more, I immediately sell my original investment and I keep the free tokens. And this is the way that I've been mining free tokens. Now, is it a get-rich-quick scheme? No. Is it a scheme? No. Might it all con just completely collapse tomorrow or even right now? Yes, but so far so good. So uh, the top six plays right now, uh, Matic, which yesterday got up to a 97, if you can believe it, which was a strong, strong effing buy. Uh, Matic, Dent, which is a meh, uh, Phantom, Ravencoin. How Ravencoin made this list, I will never understand, but this is based on a variety of factors. Uh, Sia Coin. And sandbox. Uh, so, for those of you that don't know what Ravencoin is, it's a fork of Bitcoin. That's like 21 billion coins as opposed to 21 million. Um, 
It's by Tron Black and Bruce Fenton. Very interesting guys. Uh, Bruce is really, really funny. He's really, really sharp. Um, and he's kind of a weirdo, and I like him. Um, and what's crazy, we don't even get along. We've chatted back and forth quite a bit. We don't really get along, but he's really funny, and it's, uh, sometimes that's enough. Uh, see a coin. Um, think of it as the poor man's file coin. It's cheap. It's distributed file storage. They've been around forever. Um, you know, it may not be a bad play. Again, the numbers don't lie. And this Vortex score takes in a lot of things. And Axie, which I don't know enough about to really lever, you know, to, to, to really, really weigh in on it. Jerry, do you have anything on these six that, that you find interesting? No. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, what's in the news? Uh, Blue Zell and Genesis Shards NFT partnership. Who cares? Like, I'm kind of over this whole, this initial NFT craze. I'm over it. If it isn't uh, uh, top, if it isn't the tops baseball cards that I just laid into like an idiot, and if it isn't NBA top shots, and if it isn't something magical um, by a few of the artists that I follow um, through Nifty or whatever, then I just don't really care. I think that thing, luckily, I think the NFT nonsense is starting to abate. Um, uh, other news, two hours ago, JP Morgan partners with Singapore's DBS to launch a blockchain-based payment platform. The only thing that was notable is the, is who's left out of that. Uh, Ripple. Okay, and let's see. Um, and great, and Binance uh, offered a new um, tokenized stock listing of Apple. So if you want to own Apple through Binance, you want to fractionalize, own it, good for you. Um, EasyFi is in the news. <laughs> the, the price change... Seems awkward to me. Up eleven hundred percent. What? We gotta look at that chart. I wow. That looks like the EKG of a crack junkie. That looks like grandma's EKG. So here's what's been happening. This thing got plundered. I don't know if you guys realize this. They got hit for about I don't know eighty million dollars last week. Poof gone it it's not a rug pull at least at this point no one quite knows what it is um anyway just be very careful is it a buy it's a 57 um i don't know man just be very careful with easy fi it was one of these that was in the 90s i made some good change off of it and then i kind of got out and i thought i wonder if i got out too early and and then it got rug pulled, like, or whatever happened. I can't say it's a rug pull, but it got nuked uh, shortly thereafter. Anyway, uh, Polygon Axie, New Cypher, Keep Network, and Phantom. Those are your price change movers. Your Twitter volume is Waves. iExec RLC, which didn't seem all that interesting to me, but it's got a lot of it's, – it's, it's tweeting about Polygon Phantom, Nexus Mutual, which insurance for crypto, which – Good luck. Uh, trading volume, Polygon. I'll tell you who they weren't insuring. They weren't insuring EasyFi because that $80 million would have wiped out Nexus. They don't have that kind of liquidity. Uh, Polygon, New Cypher, Phantom, uh, Gnosis, and Fetch. Fetch? Why is Fetch interesting, Jerry? It might have something to do with artificial intelligence. Say what? Ding. So... Um, for those of you that are trying to find Fetch, one of the cool things about ProCoin Telegraph is it gives you a list of your exchanges. So you put in your exchanges where you have accounts, and it will tell you not only um, where it's available, but it will show you the volume. And this will help you because then you can say, oh, it's liquid. It's a liquid enough exchange that I can go get it. So if you look at Gate, the volume for Fetch on Gate is 20.7 thousand. Many of us here could – could be responsible for the 24 hour volume of this coin, but you go find an exchange like MXC or KuCoin. Now you're back up into the several hundred thousands up into the million range. And then you can actually get trades to go through. So, um, and for those of you that haven't tried MXC, go bang around, take a look. I like it. it it's very similar to KuCoin in my opinion. Um, but the, you know, the more exchange exposure you get, the, the, the trickier it can become. Wow. Ravencoin just just popped 80. Huh. What's going on with Ravencoin? See, this you just go down the rabbit hole with these things. Margin trading and swaps. Oh, they're doing perpetual swaps and margin trading for Ravencoin? Why? Why? Okay. <laughs> because a gambler has got to gamble. A gamble's like, yeah, that's right. Gamble got to gamble. Okay. So it's very interesting. Ravencoin's 
listen, by hook or crook, it's getting up. I traded Ravencoin. I made my whole 2018 income off of Ravencoin. I'm not going to – listen, thank you, Ravencoin. Thank you for being a compliant community that seems to buy whatever bullcrap anyone feeds because there is just an insurmount – it's a bottomless well of buyers for this dumpster trash token. A bottomless fucking well. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's like the uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so uh, not to ignore anyone, and please stop me if I wax philosophic. Okay. We're done there. Cool. I don't think we need to go into a greater price discussion. There's not a lot of super exciting activity. Bitcoin's 54.4, so it's down about a point. Cardano, buck twenty nine. It's down from being up. Um, Ethereum is still in that kind of price discovery mode. We touched 2,700 last night. It still keeps kind of melting upward. There's a lot of discussion about a lack of uh, Ethereum available because of all the Ethereum that's staked. The difference with staking Ethereum versus these other tokens, while they may have a thawing period to unstake, Ethereum's thawing period is infinity. Uh, if you stake Ethereum in the 2.0 contract, you don't get it back until 2.0 launches, and no one knows when that is. So just be very careful and know what you're doing. Um other than that, what's interesting, uh, Mana keeps climbing. Um, that's kind of interesting. Engine is climbing back. Uh, our, our friends, oh, by the way, on one inch, the staking is now up over 11%. So it had gone down to 4%. It's back to 11%. Starts to look enticing. Uh, TVK is popping, which, again, that's that's – a protocol layer like Flow for NFTs, but they have a lot of licensing deals already worked out where Flow is really just more sports related, but still kind of cool. Fetch is doing quite well. If you guys realized how low they dipped, uh, they got as low on Sunday morning. They were 37 cents. It's 57 cents right now. So, and again, no one can pick the bottom, but if you're dollar cost averaging into the assets that you like, you, more often than not, you find yourself winning. Wax is up, thank God, because I have a bunch of uh, tops tokens. I mean, tops um, cards that are priced in wax, like a bunch more than a reasonable adult would have. And uh, the other thing is, uh, AGI it's at thirty eight cents. It was at my last buy was at thirty cents, and it got as low as twenty nine cents just for a smidge over the weekend. So. Um, it was a big bounce back yesterday. Things are kind of recorrecting today. This is very normal behavior, and here we are. Uh, Jerry, any anything that sticks out to you as being interesting? You know, yeah, actually, it's the it's not the day to day movement of the market that I find interesting. What I'm really kind of inspired by, actually, is the we're seeing in real time the S curve of a, of a new technology adoption curve, right? The 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 playing out of the adoption of these networks. We're watching that maturation happen. And when we go back is, geez, as recently as let's say 13 months ago, right? 14 months ago. And we look at a crypto market cap of somewhere in the tune of 240 to 250 billion total market cap for the entire industry and see that, you know, we're holding steady at over two trillion and just under two trillion, even when there's a major correction. I'm talking Bitcoin going down 15% major yeah. correction and other alts as high as 30, 40% correction and still seeing just under two trillion market cap. And then and then you know, rebound above that. I think this bodes well for what we're seeing, and that is cut out all the day-to-day -day noise crap and understand that the trend is the signal. The trend is the signal. Right. I love yeah. it. I mean, it, it, it's that that's gaining more and more validity for me every day. For those of you, and this is kind of a common thing. If you ever want to see these episodes or you miss part of it, whatever the easiest, easiest, easiest thing is just go to my Twitter because every day the show appears there, you can just click into it. Just click into the tweet. It has a little show and just watch the show. So at Nicholas Black 60. And I would just ask <coughs> to follow Jerry. Um, he has a lot of really cool content, good commentary, and follow Brady. 
Brady also has a lot of really good commentary, a, little, a lot of good content. So, yeah, follow us, man. Um, we don't sell you anything except brain goo. We sell brain goo. All right. And part of that, um, so I want everyone to kind of kick back. Uh, just relax for a second. We're going to, I want to go through this opinion piece. So if you're driving, I'm not going to tell you to sit back and relax, pay attention to the goddamn highway. But for everybody else, my buddy Zach out there is doing a six hour drive across the country. Well, anyway, so be careful, Zach, that you don't drive into oncoming traffic. Phil is always driving. Phil, do not drive into oncoming traffic. Everyone else that's not operating heavy machinery, you can sit back and relax. I'm going to read this article because it's important. We're going to talk about this, this Biden tax plan really quick. We're going to spend about five minutes on it. Opinion. A dumb attack on Biden's plan actually reveals the weakness of GOP arguments. And I won't just say GOP arguments. These are kind of like the weakness of a lot of arguments. So Republicans have settled on an attack against President uh, Biden's job plans. Raising taxes on ultra-rich Americans constitutes socialism. This most <laughs> buffoonish expression – uh, of this yet comes courtesy of former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who said Sunday on NBC News that raising the capital gains tax, of all things, is socialism because it constitutes redistribution of income. So let's look at it. This absurdity is actually useful. It points to a deeper intellectual scam employed by the opponents of higher taxes and one that should be exposed as the debate over Biden's plan gets underway. It's the idea that higher taxes represent a departure from a purportedly natural baseline of free market capitalism that is getting distorted by those higher taxes in a way that offends pristine free market principles. And I don't think we live in any kind of real free market. We, we live in a, a weird kind of one foot in, one foot out, but it is what it is. <clears throat> this was also voiced by House Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, of California, Republican – on Fox, Fox News, God, what a bastion of nonsense. Anyway, who suggested new taxes to fund spending on infrastructure and social programs are socialist? Uh, one wonders how roads would get built if it were not for such a socialist environment we live in. Uh, <laughs> the same old scam. This week, Biden will introduce new proposals for higher taxes on the wealthy, including an increase in the capital gains tax on those with income over $1 million, and a hike in the rate paid by earners in the top income bracket. <clears throat> Those would pay for the next phase of Biden's economic plans, which include investment in child care funding, paid medical leave, and free community college, which just me, just my opinion, <laughs> child care, paid medical leave, and community college should be available to those who want to utilize it. If you live in America, you should be able to go to college. If you live in America, child care so that you can actually have a meaningful job. If you're a single parent or whatever and paid medical leave, to me, that makes sense. Perhaps I am a commie bastard. <laughs> it comes after Biden's proposed higher corporate taxes to fund the first phase of the infrastructure of his infrastructure package. Christie's denunciation of capital gains tax hike as socialism vividly illustrates the scam that opponents will pull. The fact that we tax capital gains, which come from the sales of capital assets and overwhelmingly go to the wealthy at a lower rate than wage income, the main income of everyone else, is a policy choice. Okay, The Biden plan would tax the capital gains of millionaire investors at roughly the same level as income. So they're not saying we're going we're gonna to disproportionately attack you. They're saying if you've gotten good on the backs of everyone else, you need to pay the same. And I'm not sure I disagree. Okay. The idea that this constitutes some redistribution, let, o let alone socialism, presumes that the current tax structure is the natural order of things, right? That, that the current tax regime we live in is perfect. But in reality, it's one of the countless ways our economic order has been structured by rules created by the government via policy choices. There cannot, there cannot be a magically natural economic order that's not structured by policy choices, right? Like people have to decide on these things. This is precisely what people like Christie want to obscure. Why? Because it helps to obscure a larger truth. Many who would see these higher taxes have gotten rich in part due to various policy choices in recent decades, ones the wealthy have helped to engineer. Um, you know, Jeff talked about it yesterday, the Cantillon effect um, or the Cantillon effect, or depending on how you pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced 17. Jerry, how do you pronounce? Do you say Cantillon? Cantillon. 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 Okay, so we're going to call it Cantillon because Jerry says Cantillon. Anyway, 
Um, higher taxes would simply be another such choice to undo a fraction of the benefits those choices helped lavish on them. Real quick, Cantillon effect. What does it mean, Jerry? Not clear. Okay, so basically the Cantillon effect is this. If $10 of stimulus make their way out into society, $9 end up in the hand of the uber wealthy and $1 actually gets to the people. Why? Because when you're close to the valve, you get to siphon off money pretty much close to free and free of inflation or at least pre-inflation. By the time the money works its way out to the rubes, me and you and the rest of us listening, it's already been invested in these pockets. You wonder where asset bubbles come from? Stimulus, government programs. Why? Because these crony assholes sit there and siphon off the money. And only do they give it back when they get caught. And there are countless examples of how this, this, all of the funds, the payroll protection program, all of this kind of crap gave tons of money to uber rich people, not just uber rich people, but uber rich people that their businesses were doing just fine. But the theory was, well, take the money. Right. But it would, the money wasn't just take the money. The money was to help, you know, low income, impoverished small business owners. So just for me, the whole take the money thing doesn't, it just feels kind of icky. And once again, nine out of every $10 of the programs and stimulus went in the hands of the top kind of two to 3%. To me, that seems icky. What do you think, Jerry? You know, I, I, okay. So reading this article with you and, and going through it, there is something that has been omitted. Mm. And that is in today's world, corporate, let's just talk corporate America in the United States. The days of companies building value, not only for their shareholders, but for the world, i.e. money that came in was distributed to R&D so that better products that were more desirable would be consumed by the general public. Those days are gone. Corporations have one goal and one goal only. That is to enrich itself. Hence why corporations aren't spending money on daycare for their uh, newly mothered employees, why they're not no longer paying medical leave, why they are no longer having pensions, but yet outsourcing these destructive 401k plans. It's a system of private uh, profiteering, not free markets. Companies, I mean, if you just go down the list and look at, the companies that 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 you know used to build and you know advance through iteration new helpful desirable products those things are uh, those companies are going away you know what i mean they're just kind of gone and and in a free market they would die right if people didn't want their products they would have to pack up and go and 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 something that was desirable that people wanted would take its place well with all the shenanigans around how we deal with money and credit backstopping and uh, you know endless balance sheets that can absorb all kinds of stuff, I, I, it impairs the free the free market is impaired. Yeah. So all that all that Chris Christie nonsense that he spouted was just it, it's just garbage. Truth of the matter, the uber the uber rich they don't sell assets anyway. Who they don't give a flying f about capital gains because they never incur them it's rare that they do and for those of you that were curious what the f is it's flarn yeah they don't give a flarn <laughs> you know and and that's just the that's just the 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 handbook of the wealthy to stay wealthy is your pristine assets you never sell you leverage them for yield or you leverage them for capital to deploy in other things or to cover costs, expenses. What is rich, Jerry? While we're on the subject, because Scorpio on the problem with the thesis, Nick, is that money will not go back to the people. Well, Scorpio on one, this this isn't my theory, but I do, it does resonate with me. Um, my theory was this will exist and it will always exist. The Uber wealthy, let's face it, they make the rules and we live in their system. And until we are Uber wealthy, and hopefully crypto is kind of one of these ways of ushering in a re-democratization of capital to those that that may deserve it more or be in a better place to manage that for the future. But I don't know. 
and I'm not sure anything ever changes. Who knows? If I was uber wealthy, I might be a total douchebag to society too, right? So this is a question I want everyone to answer, and, and I'm going to have Jerry answer it, and I want you to all – what makes you rich and what makes you wealthy? So I want you guys to answer in the comments. Write the word rich and, and a net worth amount and then wealthy in a net worth amount. Patrick already came in with 15 million is rich. I think I agree with that. I think 15 million, you never work again. At least right now, this second, U.S. dollars. I think probably if you were outside the U.S., maybe that number is three. I don't know. What's your number, Jerry? What, what's your number of – what's your rich and wealthy number? It just happens to be 2.5 <laughs> will not only set – 2.5 million of portfolio value – will set me up for the rest of my life and create a perpetually increasing fund for every one of my heirs in, in, into into perpetuity. So and that's not a lot of money, 2.5 million? Yeah, just depend yeah, so then it's just where where do you live and can you obtain that quality of life? Um, Gordon Bennett has rich at 10 million, wealthy at 100 million. See, rich you can lose. In my opinion, wealth you can't lose. Wealth you've kind of gotten you've 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 hit apogee. Um, stress relief says rich is 20 million and wealth is 50. Damn. Stress relief. I mean, damn. Uh, let's see. Okay. Antonio has us at rich uh, 12 million, wealthy generation, 30 million above. So uh, rich is 12 million. Yeah. That's that's good though, man. Twelve doesn't twelve million seem like a lot? Oh my god! Not if you live in California. No, no, you no, it doesn't. It seems like nothing. Um, let's see. Sniper Princess has rich at six million. Wealth, anything above that? Well, no, six million and one dollars doesn't make you wealthy. Um, <laughs> well, maybe it does. You know what? I can't argue with your opinion. It's like I asked her what her favorite color was, and I told her she was wrong. <laughs> let's see. When you operate. <laughs> at a level of F you, you are rich when you get to do what you No, Jimmy, let me add to that. When you operate at F you level, you're rich. When you can tell other rich people to F you, you're wealthy. <laughs> uh, 3 million outside the U S that makes sense. Emmanuel's got it at 10 million euro, rich 50 wealthy. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> My poor ass opinion, 5 million rich, 50 million wealthy makes sense. Uh, let's see. Brady has us at capital gains. Where are I me? Mean, not how could the potential of taxing unrealized gains impact? They're never going to be able. That's not fair. I don't imagine they're going to be able to tax unrealized gains because where do you go to tax that? The IRS already can't do their job and they have everything right in front of them. How on earth are they going to go hunting the world for gains that haven't been assessed because you haven't cashed out? Uh, it's all bluster. If this is Janet Yellen, they ask for, you know what they do? They ask to cut off 10, 10 inches of your schlong, and they only cut off one inch, and they only wanted half an inch. So they win, and you lose less than you thought. But I, I think that's all bluster. The, a taxing of unrealized gains is stupid. Um, three bedroom in New York. Health is wealth. That's true, but I'll take 50 million and limp, and I'll buy a new leg. Matter of fact, I'll just buy a person to carry my leg around. To, to unlimp for me. I'll have, I'll buy an Olympic. Sp okay. We're going off on a tangent. All right. Um, may I, may I jump in for a second? Cause I think please. it's absolutely germane to this. And I think as fun as a question, like give me a number for what represents rich and give me a number for what represents wealthy. I think more the the best question to ask ourselves is what process does it take to attain those two things? Because they are both two different things. It's one thing to get rich. It's another thing to stay, you know, to, to acquire wealth and stay wealthy. And the process is completely different. We saw in the numbers, for instance, my numbers, two and a half million, expat Matt said 3 million. You guys in California are saying you need 20, 30 million. It's all about the process. You know, how much of what you make are you going to keep? If you live in California, and these new tax codes come along, most likely 55% of everything you thought you made is going to go somewhere else, right? Versus yeah. me at 12%. At 
that's you know when we start getting into big numbers those are monsterly uh impactive i mean they they have a a, a very different consequence to each person <laughs> bim said i only leaf blow on weekends not rich <laughs> Awesome. Okay, let's continue. We'll get this out of the way, and then we'll talk about AI. <clears throat> it's the economic rinse, stupid. In a pair of useful papers, Berkeley professor of political economy, Stephen Vogel, explains this well. Government rules enable markets to exist in the first place. Vogel notes, so the choice is how to structure markets, in whose interest and for what purpose. Those rules, Vogel explains, structure power relationships between various players and factors in the economy. The neoliberal – uh, <clears throat> turn is often described as moving toward free markets, but in many cases, free market ideology camouflaged policies that did not actually reduce government regulation, but rather redirected it in favor of those with wealth and power, right? So a lot of times these arguments are perverted and people that don't look past those initial consequences, they don't realize the unforeseen consequences have been game theoried out in the beginning in favor of the same rich people you were trying to disintermediate. Changes in labor market <clears throat> uh, weakened uh, worker power relative to employers. Changes in corporate governance channeled higher salaries to executives and prioritized shareholder gains over the stakeholder interests. Changes in financial regulation helped the financial sector seize a larger share of the economy. We see that now because the financial economy is like five times the size of the actual economy that produces real goods, which is weird because how do you have five times more – fake stuff than real stuff, but you do. I know, I know. Rehypothecation. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> a retreat on antitrust enforcement and more generous government protection for intellectual property rights have granted more market power and profits to dominant, to dominant figures such as big tech and big pharma. The big story. The top has benefited partly from economic rents or extractive gains rooted in deliberate changes in market rules. Tax policy, too, has helped channel more after-tax income upward, including taxing capital gains at a lower rate. Uh, as scholar Gabriel Zuckman illustrates quite well in this cool graph that has a lot of cool things where basically rich get way richer and the working class get crushed, the middle class get decimated, the upper middle class try to claw their way into being rich, or they get dumped down into poverty-stricken douchebags like ourselves. All right. Economist Dean Baker notes that Biden tax hikes would target many who profited in part from these economic rents. The top tax bracket includes many of the top 1% of earners who are often tech, pharma, and Wall Street executives and wealthy investors who would also face capital gains tax hike. Higher corporate taxes would hit many wealthy shareholders. We structured the market to redistribute tens of, tens of trillions in income and wealth directly upward. Biden's tax hikes would take back a small portion of this money. This is taxing back rents that we've given to those at the top. This is hard to argue against. That, that one paragraph probably sums it all up. Indeed, another feature of his proposals, reining in multinational tax avoidance. So this is the bullshit ploy where companies like Apple simply um, push their money offshore uh, and just avoid tax altogether. Period. And then they have tons of cash offshore that they don't patriate because, you know, they don't want to pay tax. I get it, but I'm not sure that it's wholly American when you make your money in the American markets off the backs of Americans and you drive down nice American streets only to take your money offshore. I don't know. Uh, as Ryan Cooper notes, rules that fa facilitate this tax avoidance via profit shifting – also emerged from policy choices, meaning that we can choose to undo them and bring back more revenue to fund public investments. Now, I'm not saying money in central planners' hands is a good place to put it, but it shouldn't be de facto going into rich people's hands either. It's either a free market or it's not. The minute you start taxing and subsidizing and creating stipends and all that. Once you've done that, you're no longer in a free market. And so this is kind of, this is where policy choice comes into play. Okay. All these insights are longtime uh, features of progressive economics, but they need centralizing right now. Indeed, Biden's brain trust appears to believe that raising rents on the uber wealthy will help justify higher taxes. The share of profits <clears throat> from rents have been increasing over time. Top Biden economic uh, advisor, David Kamen told 
Uh, taxing those rents would help rebalance long-running imbalances. The system is broken, he said. There are multiple reasons why we should be trying to fix it. This is why Republicans want to portray it as socialism precisely because they don't want you to understand what tax hikes on the wealthy would even begin to rectify because the long and the short of it is if you agree – once you start looking that these tax hikes are targeting people that unduly benefited from things like you know, COVID – Mass hysteria, worldwide pandemic, plagued housing markets, f f ridiculous Fed policy, all this. When you start looking at all the fractures in the economy and you realize that 1% to 3% of the American population that owns 90% of everything are the ones benefiting 90% disproportionately to everyone else, you start to go, whoa, man. That just seems kind of just as scammy as paying taxes in the first place. It's just as scammy as politicians taking kickbacks. Did you know, Jerry, that your average politician that gets paid $125,000 a year in a four-year career leaves a millionaire? One might add 125 plus 125 plus 125 plus 125 is half a million – of course, you're going to have to pay tax on that. They're probably in a sh shorter tax bracket, but how do they get to a million? They make 120, they make 500 over four years, and yet they, they leave office as millionaires. Huh. Where does it uh, all Ah, front loaded consulting <laughs> contracts. What a wonderful gig. Where does it all come from? So, anyway. That's just my two cents. I thought it was a cool article. Even if you don't agree with it, hey, it's just interesting to think about it. Okay? There we go. Oh, and Antonio says 174. Okay, Antonio, do 174 times four <coughs> times uh, what? What does that put you? 22% tax bracket? Take away 22% of that year on year. You're not going to be at a million. You're not even going to be at half a million. Okay. And we move on. Oh, five years and they're vested. Yeah. But in four years, they're millionaires. Yeah. Hey, can we get a question from Patsy Green earlier in the chat? Of she course. asked, Dash, D-A-S-H, is it a good project? Uh, I will tell you. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'll just tell you. I, mean, there, I don't know. It's hard to say if it's a good project or not. I can tell you in Latin America, especially countries like Venezuela and Brazil, Dash has a very large community, and it Dash is affording affording people who don't have access to other assets a way to get their diminishing, debased currency into an asset that they can actually store some value and use in commerce. So, you know, is it a good project? I think there are a lot of people in Venezuela and Brazil that would say, yes, it is. But are there people on this particular stream who are finding projects like AGI, VET, a vet uh, Fetch, sorry, Cardano, obviously Bitcoin, the king, da 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 da, da XRP. You know, finding good solid uh, projects would they would Dash be any better than those? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So etymology of Dash, it was a fork. It was a Bitcoin fork, like so many. It was yes, originally it was. called Dark Coin. If you guys remember? Um, yes. And. It was mined. I actually had some dash miners. I bought oof, 40 or 45 dash miners. I plugged them in and I was using them to, to smart mine uh, Bitcoin. So I was mining Bitcoin with dash miners indirectly. I was using pro hashing and pro hashing. What it does is it takes your, your compute power and just directs it towards the most profitable mining at the moment. And, and I did it for about two months and I thought this is a waste of time. I only made three Bitcoin. I only made 120, <laughs> 150 grand. Yeah, what a waste that was. So after it being such a pitiful waste, I uh, I sold, I boxed up. I only had, was running six of them. I had the other ones. I just started selling them as quick as possible and converting to Bitcoin. So I did take a hit on the 40 machines. I did not get back what I paid for them, but I did have the three Bitcoin and I don't sell Bitcoin. So we're okay. Uh, long story short, the best mining is buying. Okay, but as far as Dash, 
holding the token, I never did. I never even held the token, even though I had Dash mining rigs, because it didn't make sense to me. I think there's going to be a war on stable coins, and there's going to be a war on privacy tokens. Uh, they just arrested the guy that ran one of the biggest mixing facilities yesterday in L.A., uh, a Russian-Swedish uh, citizen who was here in Los Angeles, Sergei Skamovich. And anyway, he, he, <laughs> he ran a mixing service, and he had been part uh, – a lot of the MT Gox coins had been pushed through there. A lot of the other uh, – like Plus Token, all these scammy coins had been pushed through there and mixed. So anyway – um, Sergey Skamovich is uh, under arrest, money laundering, operating a money transmitter without a license, blah, 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 and everything else. He will probably cooperate. He'll probably give up all the addresses to all the MT Gox uh, scammers. I'm sure invariably a lot of those will lead back to um, Mark Carpellis. Good. Can't wait. All right. Um, thoughts on Cardano Ethiopia announcement. I think it's great. Is it a big price mover? No. Jerry and I talked about that yesterday. People still want to see volume. They want to see use, utility, and adoption. They want to see it mean something. So they announced the deal. We all knew the deal was coming. Now it's official. They'll do the official, official, official rollout of the thing tomorrow on a, on a big set of presentation they're doing, and that's great. However, um, we need to see volume. We need to see the token being utilized. It's all great. And listen, if, if we've learned anything from – from Ripple, it's that you can have 500,000 partners, but if they're not pushing volume, it doesn't mean anything. I think it's great that Cardano has partnered with Ethiopia uh, to work with students and create a national identity system. I think this is awesome. Um, Show me the volume. Show me the volume. Jerry, what do you think? No, it, I 100% agree. Until, until the movement of the coin either locks up more coin, right? So if these volumes are locking up more coin, whether it be in staking or in utilization of some D app on top of the protocol, it's kind of like, okay, great, wonderful. I mean, you know, like let's, okay, here's, here's a thing. Let's say Cardano is not ready for commerce. However, the ADA token is, is absolutely essential in the process of creating your digital identity. In other words, for Nick Black or Jerry or an Ethiopian resident or citizen to create their digital identity on the Cardano blockchain, it will require five Cardano or 10 Cardano or 20 Cardano or whatever, right? And that has to be held in perpetuity. Now, all of a sudden, it's not necessarily the volume that's important. It's the fact that X coins per person will be locked up in perpetuity to maintain that digital identity or, or something along those lines. Until the coin becomes part of the economics of the protocol, partnerships don't mean anything. It's like, okay, great. That's yeah. So what? Yeah, wonderful. Um, two good questions. One really quick. Um, the great asked, what is a mixing facility? They take a bunch of Bitcoin, they put it together and they mix it all up to obscure the sources in yes. and out so that you don't know which Bitcoin was what and who was this and that. And essentially think of it as taking all the Bitcoin, putting it, it melting it into a big sheet of glass, then smashing the glass on the concrete and sending you back your Bitcoin in tiny little pieces so that you, you, no one knows where it came from exactly. It's just this big messy. It's used for money laundering. You use mixers to money launder Bitcoin. It, they're not used often, but when they are, it's usually dubious. Don't use a mixer if you're not a, a criminal because if you do, they can track the input addresses. So even if they don't know what the, ex, what the exit address is, they know when money came in. So they can track the – in. so if you went from Coinbase to a mixer, it doesn't matter what comes out the other end. They know you went from Coinbase to a mixer. If, the, if you've ever gone from any wallet that has ever gone to any public wallet or exchange, they know. Everybody knows. And you get beat up. So there you go. Cool, man. All right. Uh, and then I have one other question. And then when Jerry gets back, we'll talk about Fetch and AGI. Uh, question. 
S2K Hobo asks, what are your thoughts on reallocation of funds into real estate with gains made from crypto or would you use uh, or would using a collateralized loan to branch in that space be a better play? Well, it depends if you want to hold the asset. If you want a collateral, a play self-collateralized loan into real estate to me makes more sense depending on the asset. So, but you have to be very careful because if let's just say you collateralize the loan and get your Bitcoin and you bought some property. That's cool. Bitcoin only goes up. But as we know, about every two and a half weeks, Bitcoin doesn't only go up. Now, the trend is upward. But what you don't want to do is you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. You borrow the maximum against it, 60, 70 percent against it. You put 700, 600, 700,000 into real estate. And then what happens if, you know, Bitcoin S's the bed for a few weeks and you get a margin call? Are you going to go sell that piece of property you got to cover the margin call? And this is why I say only, you know, and, and only with Nexo, at least right now, only with Nexo, you would borrow half of the amount of liquid Nexo you have. That's your, that's your lending cushion, right? So if you have a million dollars in Bitcoin and $200,000 worth of Nexo, my opinion, you could borrow $100,000 because if you had to liquidate your Nexo in some untimely event, you could liquidate the Nexo to cover your losses and you would lose no assets, right? You would lose nothing. So to me, that's the safety net. I wouldn't do it any other way, but this is the other side of it. If, if, and this, this is where it gets into your resolve and your belief in, uh, you know, these different assets. If you're using them to collateralize a loan and you were using a small portion of it, within limits as a down payment on some real estate. Now that makes a lot of sense to me as a way to diversify, take some of your winnings or you take the tax hit, you go to Puerto Rico, you buy the Jeep, you buy the apartment, you pay the 15 grand, you repatriate all your capital and then you decide what you're going to do with zero tax burden. And that gets, that gets into a different kind of discussion. I think it will be much easier to collateralize loans against crypto in the coming months and years. Maybe we're not there just yet, but I think we're getting there. Um, that'd be my two cents. What are your thoughts, Jerry, as far as collateralizing loans in crypto against uh, real estate? You know, here's the thing. I, I think the market is still nascent in that regard. And, and I've developed my own personal strategy, which I share all the time, so it's no secret. I never exceed a 20% debt to equity ratio. In other words, the portfolio value on the platform that I'm borrowing from, which I only use Nexo and have only used that for the last two and a half years. I never borrow more than 20% of the portfolio value, right? And I personally have um, more Nexo token value than I have total loan. So I, I have that escape mechanism if I need it. But the reason I only do 20% isn't so much for the liquidation element. It's because in my strategy, I always want to compound going forward. So I always want to have enough collateral um, earning interest that offsets any interest that I owe on any loan that I may take. So I'm always in a what you call net positive cost of capital. I'm always compounding on my portfolio value, even when I take loans against it. Mm -hmm. And I've only been able to do that with a ratio of approximately 20% debt to equity ratio. So that's my theory on that. Here's the thing. One of the strategies I've used because I don't, I didn't come into this with the experience Nick Black did. I only had X amount of capital to deal with. So I went farther out on the risk curve, took loans against my crypto, but I didn't put a down payment on a house or take that money and have it go somewhere else i put it right back on that platform in the form of more bitcoin more ethereum more this more that mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying so it, and there's an element of that that offsets that risk a little bit because i'm bringing a hard asset onto the platform against money that i borrowed against other hard assets and again keeping that constant capital uh what we call compounding effect where i'm earning more interest than the interest owes owed on the loans that I've taken. Staying that positive. Okay. Uh, stress relief asked a question. It, 
it gets into the question is gate.io ICOs. Can you explain shares and what two, two, 10 for tier? No, I can't explain that right now because that's kind of a long discussion. But basically, if you're a part of gate, depending on how, how often you trade or how big your portfolio is, it gives you different VIP levels, which lets you buy bigger allocations in these initial token offerings. But what gate does that's very nice is they don't let anybody big dick the ICOs. They figure out however many people are participating, and then they divide out the shares equally, and you have plenty of time to subscribe to the ICO. It's not like this coin list bullcrap where six people get all the tokens and everyone else gets effed, gets flarned. Sounds like you have a kind of a opinion. I mean, okay. I want to talk really quick. Um, we're, we were going to talk about uh, Singularity Net and Fetch and the coming AI, but we've been talking about all this other crazy stuff which is actually really important. But there's one, there's one key thing, whether you invest in or don't invest in crypto of any certain variety, that's on you, right? It's not, it's not Jerry and I's mission in life to get you guys to really do anything other than just ask questions. Ask a bunch of questions. Find things that you think you can explain to your grandmother that will make a meaningful change in your world, in the world, in, or, you know, what in your pocketbook in the future. I happen to think, I think Jerry and I are of the same accord. We believe that the AI space is not really being paid attention to right now. And I think if you, if you saw what the NFT space blew up, my opinion is NFTs helped a few people. AI will help every people for humanity to move forward in a meaningful way. Well, along the lines of that, where does that fall into the crypto space? Well, obviously, decentralized um, the idea of distributed ledgers makes a lot of sense for many reasons, but also the ability of these uh, of these economic agents to manage money in real time, 24 hours a day, something we can't do without emotion, something we can't do without indecision, right? Always making the rightest, the rightest decision based on your principles in real time all the time. We can't do that. So we're going to be living in an environment where – uh, AEAs, autonomous economic agents, are doing this work for us, right? And what is this? An autonomous economic agent is an intelligent agent acting on an owner's behalf with limited or no interference and whose goal is to generate economic value to its owner. Now, we will probably do um, more deeper dive maybe later in the week. I'll get Jerry to come back, and we'll talk specifically about Singularity Net and Fetch. But if, if you learn nothing more – if you, if you just open yourself up to the idea that you won't be trading anymore, well, you really won't be, you shouldn't be trading, period, but that you won't be trading at all. It'll be one of these economic agents, autonomous, this little very clever robot that's going in and doing all of the things based on your kind of your thesis, your theories, your ideas, and acting on behalf of you in the best way possible without the intervention, without the interference of emotion or biology <laughs> or human or bias. Genius. And all it's doing is trying to do what's best for your balance sheet. Singularity Net is, is creating an AI marketplace, right? Where you can share, monetize AR services at scale. This is it basically if, if companies and institutions and individuals want to buy AI resources – they will go and they will take a look at Singularity Net and they will shop and fill up a shopping cart full of AI resources that they could employ. And many of them will be based on these AEAs, these, these autonomous economic agents. If you go to Fetch, and uh, they actually have a really cool – their Medium, they have a lot of cool stuff on Medium, these articles about Fetch.ai. But go to Fetch.ai or you can go to Medium.com and then look up Fetch. Uh, they have mainnet staking. So does uh, uh, AGI. Fetch is all about the financial side of artificial intelligence and these autonomous economic agents. So I would urge you to do do some do some deeper due diligence. Just a real quick, and then we will wrap up. Uh, Singularity Nets at thirty nine forty cents. These things are cheap, right? Not compared to buying it at three cents, but cheap. 
if you believe that the future looks a lot different than the right now. I happen to believe that. Uh, fetch, what is it, 56, 57 cents, something like that. It's 58 cents. Okay. So these are comparatively, uh, you know, compared to a lot of the stuff that we own on our balance sheets, these are not super expensive. I'm not telling you to do anything. I would just urge you to take a closer look at the idea that maybe AI is a direction that the cryptocurrency space will go off in and that for humans to move the needle, we're going to need to leverage a lot of AI. And yeah. So, oh, and by the way, Professor XRP, tell your boss, tell your boss he's fired. Don't tell him that. Do not tell your boss that. All right. Um, cool. Uh, Jerry, parting words, final thoughts. Again, back to what I opened up with, and that is cut out all the noise. Cut out all the noise. Look back through history. Take a look at when we went from household phones with wires to wireless and, and try to get a grip and understand how that network grew and what new users came on and new functionalities and how that changed that industry to where we are today. Then do the same thing with the Internet. Then do the same thing with compute power, wireless through handheld devices. I call it the mobile wave, sort of Michael Saylor. And look at how that dematerialized things and we went forward. The same thing is happening in financial services. The same thing is happening with AI, robotics, dun, 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 dun. Yes, on one hand, jobs, tons of them, tons and tons and tons of jobs are going to be lost to economic actors that are nothing more than code and artificial intelligence. On the other hand, there's gonna be opportunities deluxe for all kinds of new things that are coming. So if you're not willing to change, you can pretty much, you're screwed. If you're willing to change, learn and adapt and go where the trend is going, you've got an opportunity to become very wealthy, not only financially, but from a, you know, how, if you find a way to have your purpose in life fit in with the trend, you're going to have a very purposeful life going forward. You know what I mean? And, and so that, that's really the crux of it. If you can understand that the trend is the signal and all that other stuff is just noise, Biden's tax plan, noise, right? Yeah. What Chris Christie says is noise. The trend is that's where we're going. And you can already see it. We have precedent. The largest companies on the planet, the Apples, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, they're by far largest monetary investment on a yearly basis is research and development. And a large chunk of that is AI. Well, I'm not going to have final thoughts because Jerry had my final thoughts. <laughs> um, well done. Um, we will see you guys soon. I'm going to try to con Jerry into coming back tomorrow. Um, because I mean, round two, round two. Uh, and until then, don't do anything. My poor insolvent drunk, strung out on mess, smoking water, high as a kite grandmother wouldn't do. And, uh, she's being real chill today. It's just straight black tar heroin.